Hey, how did that sneaky snail get in here? Hello all, welcome to your video on the integumentary system. I will take you through all of the required material from chapter 5 and then at the end of this video I will take you back to chapter 4 and go over tissue repair. Let's take a look at a histological slide of the skin to see the two layers of the skin and the underlying layer that helps to anchor the skin in place. The two layers of skin are the epidermis and deep to that is the dermis and then underlying the dermis we have the hypodermis. This is not part of the skin but helps to anchor the skin in place. And taking a look at the epidermis a bit more closely we see it has this wavy appearance and two very distinct areas of the epidermis that we will look at in more detail in a close-up slide. In contrast to the epidermis is the dermis which also has two different areas that we will look at in detail in another slide. And finally we see the hypodermis which is also known as the subcutaneous tissue. Looking at the epidermis, the things that you need to know are that it is a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that the cells are called keratinocytes and there are five layers of them and there's another cell called the melanocyte. So looking at the epidermis more closely we can see the five different cell layers. We've got the stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and the stratum basal. There are only two of these cell layers that I would like you to be able to recognize, point out, and know something about and that is the stratum basal and the stratum corneum. As I mentioned earlier, the main cell of the epidermis is the keratinocyte, which produces uh, a protein called keratin, which is very hard and strong. And keratin is also found in nails and hair. Now the stratum basal is the deepest and most mitotically active layer of the epidermis and all of the other layers of cells are derived from these cells. As the cells migrate toward the surface they become filled with keratin and begin to die. By the time they reach the surface as the stratum corneum these cells are flat and scale-like and are sloughed off. This is the tail of the stratified squamous epithelium. All cells destined to the same fate of eventually jumping ship. Taking a look now at a picture from your textbook, we can again see the cells of the epidermis. The various layers of the epidermis revealing cells in various stages of their lives. And we can also see a highly specialized cell known as the melanocyte. This cell produces the pigment melanin, which eventually will be shared with all of the keratinocytes protecting their nuclei from UV radiation. One final note about the epidermis. There are no blood vessels that traverse this part of the skin. And so cells in the basal layer are reliant on the blood vessels in the underlying dermis layer to get their metabolic needs met. And as cells migrate toward the stratum corneum, they get further away from their source and are cut off and eventually die. Now we'll be looking at the dermis and some specifics of this layer. The dermis has two sections to it. The area directly deep to the epidermis is called the papillary layer and is a loose areolar connective tissue. This area contains many blood vessels and is a site of defense for the body. The immune cells of the loose connective tissue patrol this area waiting for any invaders to attack. The deeper section of the dermis is called the reticular layer. This layer is composed of dense irregular connective tissue which gives skin its toughness and resiliency. There are numerous structures that are found throughout the dermis. Some of them are actually structures that are derived from the epidermis but have migrated into the dermis to reside there. We will name and describe many of these structures in the upcoming parts of this video. Here's the figure from your textbook showing an actual histological slide of the skin with parts of the dermis labeled. This is a really nice slide that I found and it shows the 
epidermis very nicely with the keratinized layer of the stratum corneum and then just deep to that is the papillary layer of the dermis and then even deeper is the reticular layer of the dermis and then you find a lot of structures that we're going to be naming some of them I'll name right now such as this structure here is a hair follicle it's a very nice sebaceous gland this is some smooth muscle associated with hair follicles called the erector pili muscle and so those are some of the structures that you can see on this slide Let's take a look at a couple more slides to get you ready for lab and then I will talk about the functions of these structures after identifying them. So if we take a look at this slide we can see very nicely the delineation between the epidermis and the dermis and in the dermis we see um, some really nice dense irregular connective tissue so that's a really good example of that. Concentrating on this structure right here this is a hair follicle. If you take a look at the cells of the hair follicle you'll notice that they look very similar to the epidermal cells and that's because they basically are. When the epidermis was uh, developing some of the cells began to migrate down into the dermis uh, forming an invagination and becoming specialized into hair cells and so that's how the hair follicle developed. Now associated with the hair follicle is this really nice representation of a sebaceous gland and the sebaceous gland will secrete its products right into the hair follicle. And then below that, you can see some adipose tissue. Let's look at one more slide, and then we'll take a look at the model that we will see in lab. In this slide, we see two hair follicles. We see one hair follicle actually all the way up to the surface, and a nice sebaceous gland associated with that. And we also see the smooth muscle um, associated with the hair follicle called the erector pili muscle. This is the other hair follicle, uh, which you only see a small section of. And then in this area, we see a sweat gland. Let's now go through this picture of our model, and I will highlight those structures that I have pointed out on the slides. Let's talk a little bit about the function of these appendages. As I mentioned, all of these appendages are derived from the epidermis. Now hair is also called pili, and it consists largely of dead, very hard, keratinized cells. And the purpose of hair is to sense insects, uh, protect the scalp, shield the eyes, and filter the air in the nose. And associated with the, each hair follicle is a smooth muscle called the erector pili that when it is stimulated will straighten the hair and cause goosebumps. When we're cold or when we're tickled, when something brushes against our skin. We can also see the sebaceous glands, also known as the oil glands that are associated with hair follicles, which secrete an oily substance called sebum. Sebum forms a moisture barrier on the skin and also moisturizes the hair. And it also contains a bacterial cytal. And they become very active at puberty when hormone levels rise. Another type of gland which is independent of hair that's found in the skin is the sweat gland. There are two types, but for our purposes we do not need to distinguish between the two. The secretions of sweat glands are mostly water but also contains salts, vitamin C, antibodies, fatty substances, 
proteins, and metabolic waste. The pH of sweat is acidic and can range from 4 to 6, and it is a powerful source for cooling down the body through evaporation and helps prevent the body from overheating. As far as nails are concerned, they do serve a purpose for grasping objects and, of course, the all-important act of scratching an itch. For our purposes, clinically, the nails in the nail beds will undergo many changes with disease states, and to be able to recognize these changes gives us invaluable diagnostic clues. So to understand the appearance of normal nails in all types of individuals will uh, allow us to be able to recognize when there is a sign of underlying disease states. I'll be going through some of these changes shortly. As you can see from these pictures of some famous and some not so famous people, there's a wide assortment of normal skin color and tone. Skin color comes from three pigments, melanin, carotene, and hemoglobin. Melanin is produced by melanocytes in response to exposure to UV radiation. Carotene is a precursor to vitamin A and is stored in the corneum layer. The more beta-carotene rich foods we eat, the more our skin takes on our, an orange U. Hemoglobin is seen from the underlying blood vessels and is easy to see in light skin individuals. So skin color will change in certain disease states and again these changes can give important diagnostic clues. I put together a slideshow of the more common, more easily recognizable changes that you can see in the skin, nails, and in the hair. There are many physical changes that the skin and its appendages go through with age and disorders uh, that they would be too numerous to name here. So please know the names of the three types of skin cancer. There's the basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma, and that the most common and least malignant is the basal cell, whereas the most dangerous is the melanoma. Be able to describe the difference between a first, second, and a third degree burn. And also know that there is a way to estimate the extent and severity of burns using the rule of nines to estimate the amount of fluid loss. Medical intervention in the early stages of severe burns is critical to saving the life of the victim. We will talk more about burns and other homeostatic imbalances in lecture. We will also go into the basics of tissue repair in lecture. Your textbook does a very nice job of giving a timeline of events for a non-extensive skin wound. Please read this section of chapter 4 and we will elaborate and focus on this information in class together. We will also revisit wound repair when we learn the immune system in anatomy and physiology too. So that's it for this video. See you all when we meet again.